Bob is uh, uh, officially you're the second alderman of the, uh, the city of Aiklo. Uh, it's not Ilko, but Aiklo. And Aiklo is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right uh, uh, in the middle between Bruges and Ghent, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Entre les tours de Bruges et Gant, like Gabriel uh, <laughs> once said. Nice, nice. And we've asked uh, uh, Bob to uh, uh, tell a bit, little bit about the, the journey the, the city of Aiklo has gone through to create, let's say, uh, a, a vision on an integral let's say energy system for the for the city and then within that ecosystem address some of the main projects therein and then maybe focus also because we have a, a group that is really interested in, in the district heating element of it to also talk about that element how that is addressed or being addressed in the city of Aiklo and maybe then in closing having some lessons learned around okay I would never do this again or if I only knew this then uh, mm -hmm. Uh, if that's okay with you, uh, Bob. Uh, yeah. yeah, perfect. I'll do as I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, with no further ado, I want to give you the floor. Um, I'll switch off my, my uh, at least I'll mute myself mm -hmm. at least, and probably right. also switch off my camera just to you know, save some bandwidth as, as well. But so we'll be here. No problem. Okay, and I'll if just... You, if you want to share your screen, that's yeah. possible, uh, through the controls on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Do you see those, Bob? Yeah. Okay. All right. One thing is happening. Yeah, thanks. Okay, can, I, uh, can everybody understand me? Uh, or at least hear me? <laughs> yes. Perfectly. Yes. Perfect. Uh, yeah. yes. Perfect, thanks. So... Um, I'd like to start off with uh, with the idea if you've ever considered energy as a local product, um, because up until only seven generations ago, all energy used to be local. Um, wait, I'm just trying to, yeah, okay. So if, if you look at the, the whole evolution of, of energy, you can say that uh, what is energy? Energy is a way of uh, having or, get, or of enabling us to do um, um, labor, whether it's uh, through biomass or through mechanical energy. Actually, all energy uh, once was local. And you could say that uh, these energy systems um, evolved uh, depending on their surrounding. If you can, uh, if you go way back, uh, hunter gatherers were able to like harvest up to 5,000 kilocalories uh, per day uh, from their environment. And uh, when this went on um, until the end of the last ice age, this grew um, uh, to 8,000 kilocalories. The agricultural revolution enabled us to have to to go or to organize our, ourselves to uh, harvest 30,000 kilocalories um, from the surrounding. And but what we saw from this uh, agricultural revolution until the industrial revolution is that this was more or less the the organic ceiling of what was uh, possible for one person to get from his uh, surroundings. But then Suddenly, we discovered fossil fuels, which, um, like, yeah, in, in, in just one, uh, in just seven generations, changed uh, the whole perspective of, of how we look at energy. Energy grew from a local product to a global product. Um, and, uh, like, lots of interesting or uh, also societal things happened. Um, we became a capitalistic system, uh, democracy uh, evolved, nation states uh, evolved. So it's very strange to see that in this short period in uh, history, uh, all these interesting things became possible um, because of, or uh, with one of the reasons, uh, the, the way we collect energy from our uh, environment. And then, yeah, at, at this point, we're at um, the, the, the whole transition, how to, how to switch from fossil fuels to renewables. And one of the very interesting things is also how we will organize ourselves to make sure that the, the things that we 
um, or the good things that we um, came up with in the past uh, seven generations, that they don't get lost in the process of having this energy transition. And that is actually what we are trying to do in, uh, in ECLO. Because uh, if you look at uh, just the EU or, or Belgium, if you see how much money uh, we spend for the import of um, fossil fuels every day, every year, we come up with uh, like a quite staggering number. For the EU, every day, um, 1 billion euros is transferred um, to not, uh, let me put it safely, uh, the, the most um, friendly regimes or Western friend, friendly regimes. For Belgium, it's 20 billion euro each year. And for our little city in Eclo, 20,000 inhabitants. That is also, it's it's 40 million euro uh, each year that we pay for uh, the importation of fossil fuels. And if you put it into perspective of uh, inequality, um, you could say that um, people with uh, a lower wage are actually um, having to work more for this import. Um, people with low wages um, have you could say that their labor or what they make in 20 days is paying for their annual uh, fossil fuel bill, while uh, people with a higher income is, um, is, is, uh, are paying for their fossil fuel bills with only 10 working days. And it's very important to make this division because it tells a lot with um, who's working for who and where the money goes. And uh, well, it's not only the money, but it's one of the elements. So one of the things we did different in our city, in, in Eklo, um, is that we approached the, the whole energy transition story um, as something else, um, uh, as a, uh, a complete like um, vision with uh, in which four elements are key. This is ownership of the local community, participation of the local uh, uh, community, making energy uh, again a part of our identity as a city and of course keeping the added value of this uh, energy transition local. And this is an image, I, I always put this in, in any um, presentations I, presentation I uh, can make because uh, these two gentlemen on the right of me, uh, they actually started the whole process uh, already 20 years ago. Uh, some uh, civil servants, Dirk in the middle of the picture, <coughs> and Jan de Pauw from uh, EcoPower, the large, um, already now the largest cooperative in uh, Belgium on uh, the right. And uh, they started with a story um, of building three uh, wind turbines in Eclo through the, um, the philosophy of direct participation. And direct participation meant that all the uh, inhabitants or, of our city were able to um, in not only invest in the uh, wind turbines that were built, the first three wind turbines that were built on our um, like territory, but um, they could also have a say in what's happening with the, the wind turbine. So uh, they could decide whether or not to choose for a high dividend or to have um, a lower energy bill. And what we saw, and this is really strange, is that this direct participation had uh, an immediate effect on how people looked at uh, energy. They were not simply um, passive consumers anymore, but they began to think and, and began this, um, this whole operation of saving energy for themselves. So in only three years, uh, the energy consumption of uh, cooperative participants uh, dropped by a half. So if you know that uh, your uh, consumption drops by half, you could say that the three wind turbines, uh, the three cooperative wind turbines were actually producing for six uh, only after three years. But in time, um, this whole um, public support, we, we, we knew or we were feeling that the public support for uh, new wind turbines was beginning to crumble, uh, also due to uh, regulation on uh, a higher level that was actually contradictory with our positive findings. And so chaos reigned. Um, 
people had the feeling that in every piece of agricultural land, uh, it had the potential that a wind turbine could pop up. So what we um, gave the people was um, some sort of spatial security so that they would know in, uh, which, uh, in which areas wind turbines uh, could erect and in uh, which uh, areas the wind turbines would be excluded uh, or beyond any consideration of, um, of getting a building permit. So the, the red area you see here is in the north of our city and uh, there's, that's, this is the concentration zone and it's um, a broad lines or surrounded with an exclusion zone. But of course, um, this was not the, the end of the, our story. Uh, it would be a very small uh, and short presentation if it was. Um, but also uh, the wind turbines that would be built there, uh, they would have to um, fulfill or meet certain regulations, uh, extra regulations which are uh, above normal building permits and spatial um, like spatial conditions. So what we demanded uh, as a city council in uh, 2014 was that uh, for every wind turbine, 25% uh, of the participation should be opened for the city. So the, the, the city should be able to invest to, or co-invest in every wind turbine. Um, but also uh, a quarter of uh, the wind turbine should be open for citizens' participation. That's on the input side. On the output side, uh, we uh, we demanded for from project developers that five thousand euros each year should go directly into an energy fund of the city, and five thousand euro should go directly into a neighborhood fund. This all just to balance out um, to to get the the costs and and benefits the uh, a bit more in balance because what you see uh, if you build a, a wind turbine is that uh, the benefits are for the the people who build the wind turbine on a slot of uh, a few square meters and um, it, it gets erected for, um, uh, construction is erected for 100, 120 meters high and the whole surrounding have, a, uh, just the visual effect is one thing, uh, but you could also say that the common of wind is harvested only by the, the first one who gets to claim this, uh, this wind turbine or this, this uh, right to collect uh, wind energy. And so because of that, because we want to balance these things out, uh, we set up this uh, democratic support model. And uh, where we are now, I'm sorry for the Dutch in this, in this slides, is that um, at uh, this year, or uh, sorry, last year in 2020, uh, we um, made it possible that um, we, that's 22 wind turbines uh, in total were built. And together with um, uh, solar and uh, heat coupling, we get uh, or we produce in our city 170 gigawatts per hour uh, as a production. But if you and if you put that uh, against our energy use, uh, you see that we are only using uh, in our city 133. Uh, gigawatt per hour, which means that uh, from last year on, uh, we had uh, a local and totally green energy production of 130 uh, percent. This hasn't this hasn't cost us anything. Uh, we did this without uh, big investments of the city, and also without uh, any large. Um, um, how do you say it's uh, civil servants or, or, or with large pressure of our administration. It's just about making the framework in which uh, it, uh, we invited all project developers to come to our city and invest in um, wind energy and green energy in, in general, because we want to go further than that. So this is a, an over, a small overview of um, what this actually means in financial terms. So one wind turbine business as usual only has, um, uh, has zero income for the city and zero income for the, the, our citizens. Uh, 
the owner of the land gets 25,000 and more or less the project developer gets uh, 250,000. So it's just about having this um, cost benefit uh, being more in balance. And if you know that um, in this last wave of wind turbines, 14 were built, you see the direct effect of uh, 14 wind turbines. And of course, uh, especially if you would uh, look at this from uh, an, a perspective of 20 years, this is um, a lot of money that uh, either goes, uh, stays local or drifts away. And if you want to build uh, a democ democratic support for the, the energy transition, I think it's vital to get um, also the positive effects of this energy transition, visual and tangible for uh, the local community. And uh, so one thing we want to do with uh, the with the money that we get from uh, this um, uh, from these wind turbines, the the benefits of the um, of, of the the wind turbine uh, of the wind energy is to put these in a local climate fund and a local climate fund uh, in order to speed up the transition and use the um, the turbines that were built in uh, a first uh, uh, wave and second wave of uh, development actually use them to uh, speed up the energy transition. And this is like a, a small calculation we made of how much CO2, CO2 we could possible, uh, possibly um, capture in our city. And we see that we actually have a, a climate positive um, uh, potential uh, to go to uh, CO2 reduction of 126 and a half percent. If we would succeed in um, building the wind turbines, having extra biomass, and these are the the, the, the green uh, thing, uh, the, the green areas you see on the map, uh, and covering all our roofs with solar, and uh, also investing in a big, uh, big district heating network. So I'm I'm going to continue for the last part of the presentation with uh, with four very interesting projects of uh, what we could do with uh, all this this uh, this money and actually um, actually it's these four projects all go in the same uh, direction and fit perfectly in the same vision that uh, by keeping energy local you could do really interesting things. One of the things that we came up with is uh, uh, we could actually use this um, this participation of people in poverty to get them a direct reduction of their uh, energy bill uh, with 200 euro each year. And it's just by cutting out the, um, the big energy co um, corporations and the big energy multinationals who get uh, who give a big dividend to shareholders in uh, well with us it's mainly in Paris so uh, by keeping added value local and keeping energy bills low you could like build a, a democratic support by uh, showing people on their electricity bill what these wind turbines uh, mean in practice for them and of course, and that's probably the one of the things uh, you're uh, most interested in. We also use this uh, to build uh, a new legal framework for uh, district heating in uh, in our city, uh, because one of the things that we are missing in Belgium and in the north of Belgium is um, a legal framework for building uh, district heating in our in the public sphere. So district heating networks in Belgium are still limited to individual projects or like um, small extensions of historical grids. And so what we did is uh, we put out a public tender uh, for our total or, or, or our total city or, or the, the whole public space of our total city. And we made, we, we asked of course uh, the, the uh, conditions of uh, again within the philosophy of our energy transition that um, uh, direct participation was uh, very important and um, also the the price should be regulated that it wouldn't cost more than the gas price um, and we actually got uh, two partners willing to uh, build uh, 
a, a, a district heating system, which will be uh, the biggest in uh, Belgium, not just by a few meters or by a few kilometers, but, but doubling the size of um, like the biggest district heating network currently uh, like uh, developed in, uh, in Belgium. We will connect this not only with, the dist uh, with uh, our big waste plants in the north of the city, this is just the first phase, but in the, in the future, we will, um, we will decentralize production. So the district heating will network will actually also um, function as like a, a giant, um, you could even call it a giant battery for the city so that the, the surplus of wind is, um, is converted into uh, heat. Um, the biomass will uh, make, or the local biomass will uh, be added value also um, rests or, or heating processes in the city for of our industry will be injected. And this all to have like a, a decentralized network of uh, cooling and heating. And of course, um, it's not only the, the CO2, um, story we, we link this with, but also the financial story. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to implement or, or put this um, uh, Euro story next to the CO2 story. Another thing uh, that we did is um, with the similar conditions, with similar approach, is that we, um, instead of having every, um, every household uh, decide for themselves or uh, if, if uh, solar panels are um, costs uh, or if they have the enough um, funds to put solar panels on their roof, we actually, through third party participation, we opened up the possibility, so not the obligation, but the possibility, so every, part, uh, every household could get uh, cooperative solar panels on their roofs. So uh, we are now in the phase of implement, in the first phase of this pro uh, uh, project, but in the end, also here, it should be possible that uh, solar panels could like be um, constructed on all rooftops in ECLO. And just like as a last thing, um, like a last idea, one of the steps we haven't uh, done, and uh, we talked uh, with ILCO, we talked yesterday about uh, how to expand the, the, the way we approach energy is also, um, on, it, it goes further than just this local approach of cooperative energy. It's, it's about the whole economy. And this is a slide of uh, uh, an area in or, uh, a neighborhood in Amsterdam where they calculated um, for five, uh, 1,500 households how much um, money could be kept inside of the local economy and how much uh, um, added value and how much um, labor or, or working spaces uh, could be like opened up if uh, economy could, uh, could remain uh, on the local level. So this goes uh, from vegetables, seven full-time employees, uh, fruit, six uh, uh, meats, four full-time uh, employees um, and yeah you, you can go as far as you can or you want with that um, especially for low capital goods and um, this is very interesting to work with so to close off um, some final considerations um, what I would suggest is uh, that we need to rethink the whole energy system and think it's uh, it's local not uh, there's no there's no one solution um, for transforming or um, the transition of the energy system so look for the uh, organic energy dna of your place what uh, like before this this uh, seven generations ago how did your community uh, come up with uh, their energy solutions and um, work something out with uh, that as the basis because it's normally um, the most logic thing. Uh, another thing I would say or what I suggest is the, the, the thing big. Uh, it's not about enabling the energy transition just for uh, the people with uh, or high income people but what's strong 
uh, about our story is that we make it an inclusive story of the whole community. So we need to start thinking of how to include um, also people in poverty, especially people in poverty, not to get the big divide that you see happening elsewhere that, uh, uh, the, uh, that of the, the, the green church and the, the yellow jackets. So, and of course, and I think you've noticed this throughout the presentation, um, that energy is, is also capital and it's about uh, getting the added value of the energy transition uh, inside of your city and making the, the effects or the possible effects uh, tangible. So this was it. Um, thank you. I hope you have a few, um, or you picked up a few ideas and that you can like work things out in your city because um, the, city, the, the story of, of my small city shouldn't be unique. Um, we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have like a big budget of big city. Um, I only have one uh, or not even uh, one full-time employee at my disposal to work all these, thing, these things out. Um, but it's, it's about like working with what you have. And uh, if you learn how to work with what you have, it's the um, creativity pops up and there are always opportunities to get the, um, uh, a new energy system for your own local community. So thank you. I can only say that was great, Bob. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, a really inspiring story. And actually on another screen, I was already looking at real estate in Aiklo, whether I could move there. <laughs> <laughs> Although my own town is also quite nice. Uh, but uh, if there's any questions for Bob, uh, because I think you know, working from a vision opens certain perspectives. That's what I'm taking from this. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really great uh, from that perspective. And you don't need to uh, have a lot of resources uh, to make things uh, work. That's also what I'm getting. But the philosophy of thinking local and thinking about your organic energy DNA that, you know, that fits your, your place, literally, is, uh, is opening up these perspectives, I think. Any questions for, uh, for, for, for Bob uh, or thoughts or additions? I can see Emilia waving there. <laughs> Hi, yes, fascinating and inspiring uh, presentation. So thank you very, very much. Um, this is just the Celsius in me. Um, what does uh, your energy company look like? Is it uh, state, oh, is it city owned or is it uh, a big energy company? Because you, you from the city must have a very tight collaboration with the energy company to be able to put all these things in place. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not city owned or state owned. Um, it's because um, yeah, no, it's not city owned or state owned. What we just did is open up a, a public tender for um, opening. It started with some uh, uh, small plots of land uh, owned by the city, um, but and later on, it's just about like making regulations for our, for the whole city. So it's not uh, city owned or state owned. It's more uh, citizen owned. So it's a, a citizen cooperative who is doing most of the projects. But for the district heating network, um, the the investments costs were too high. The the, the technology was um, too sophisticated, and they uh, joined up with Veolia. And um, they made a special purpose vehicle. Um, and it's actually also a very interesting uh, side project because the whole uh, legal process of getting a special purpose vehicle between um, a, a big multinational on the one hand and a small cooperative on the other hand, there's actually like trying to combine water and fire uh, because they have totally opposite um, yeah, business cultures, but actually we made, we were able to make this work because uh, Veolia is also now getting into the process of realizing that they need this local support if you want to, um, that people like cut off their gas, uh, their, their trusted gas installation. Um, they need to know that it's not just because the prices are equal, but they get uh, extra benefits if they could join and if they can actually own a bit of the, the district heating network. So the citizen participation is, uh, is very important. And uh, it's actually very, really cool to see that we were able to get uh, a citizen cooperative EcoPower 
team up with uh, the big multinational of Veolia. Yeah, so, yeah, so follow, following on that, uh, Bob, what I found interesting in your, uh, as part of the, the, the wind turbines, that indeed the business case becomes more attractive if you, for a, for a, a commercial partner, if you have a democratic model involved. That, that's the interesting, that's, so it works hand in hand. That's, that's quite nice to see. Yeah, because um, if, you, if you look at it uh, from the business model, from the, uh, even the big multinationals um, uh, in the whole of Belgium, um, only 50% of all permits get, uh, 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 or of all applications end up getting a building permit. So there's a lot of um, uh, opposition by the neighborhood. There's um, a lot of legal fights and the only ones who benefit from that are the lawyers. Um, and I don't want to criticize lawyers and they, they will actually, they can do a great good. Uh, but it's better to avoid them at all costs. And uh, a lot of the, the bigger companies actually have um, acknowledged this and uh, went, uh, went along and with the whole democratic support model. And we were able to um, finish up the whole project without any uh, legal lawsuit. So all the, per all the applications ended up 100% uh, by getting uh, their permits because of this democratic support model. Excellent. So it's a good, very good best practice in terms of public acceptance of, of yeah. change, basically. Yeah. Except our minister doesn't want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and questions from uh, from the rest of the uh, of the audience. How did how did you get so much support at the local level? from people living there? It's, we've been trying to build support for uh, 20 years. So it's not uh, the, the results I'm present, presenting now is a story of 20 years. And it started with three wind turbines. And it's about community building. And it's about um, not only having the, the added value to your, to your uh, direct circle of uh, corporate uh, cooperatives, but also having this, uh, this community, um, like giving talks, um, having people of the, the energy corporation um, have like present, give presentation days in schools, uh, have organizations, NGOs, invited and, and business operations invited to these wind turbines and look at and, and make them uh, or explain to them what the, the importance and the possibilities are of the, uh, the energy transition. So it's, uh, it would be interesting or uh, very convenient to say that it's one thing, but it's not one thing. It's uh, a continued approach of, of 20 years of, of giving talks and giving um like opening the wind turbines for visits and it's all that combined and um if you look at our neighboring city they um you know how it goes the the, the competition between two cities uh, and at the point that we were building three wind turbines they were building four and uh, but what did they what they did different was they didn't work with uh, direct citizen participation, with, but with financial participation. And uh, the, the added value of the, um, of the wind turbines was um, di directly transferred. So they, from the big project developers, they got a bag of money um, in 2000. Of, uh, I think it was about uh, 200,000 euros. So a lot of money. Um, at once and of course this money is now already long spent and what our deal was is that we got uh, 5,000 euro for each turbine each year so every year again we get like the notification of yeah uh, with these uh, with, with um, a bit of the profits we are helping people to insulate their houses uh, we're we're um, investing in uh, double gla double glass we're making schoolyards um, better uh, or putting solar panels on on school roofs so the the it's a, a continuous process while uh, a lot of companies want to look at um, public support as like a project up until the permits and after that 
they like take their hands off. So this is a very important like switch of uh, or different approach that also big companies should uh, yeah keep focused on.